Welcome to Promote Profit Published. I'm your host, Juliet Clark. And today we're going to have a branding expert that's going to be speaking to us who did some incredible work on one of our clients' books. And, and I felt it was worthy enough that we needed to talk to her more and explore what she's up to and how she helps people. Um, but before we get started, Remember to go over and download your free copy of Breakthrough Author Magazine. You can find it at BreakthroughAuthorMagazine.com. If you're over on LinkedIn and you want to get a copy without opting in, which I get it. I don't like to opt into a lot of things these days, uh, mainly because the drip campaigns are just sell, 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 which we don't do, by the way. Um, you can go over to Breakthrough Author Newsletter over on LinkedIn and subscribe over there. You get the newsletter dropped in. In, as well as some other things um, on uh, using LinkedIn newsletter. Also, and lastly, and then I'll jump into Kelly, I swear, um, is our new site is up, authortrafficschool.com. So what we did with this site was we decided that uh, we were going to call author platform building what it really is. And it's really the art of building um, the platform in a way with the tech that that our authors learn how to drive traffic. That's really what it's all about. You can build a funnel, you can um, get out there with lead magnets, but if you don't do it in the right way that connects with your ideal audience, um, you're not going to drive the traffic you're looking for. And this is super important when you try to sell books. If you don't have this perfected by the launch, your launch could be in big trouble. So uh, go check it out. We have everything. We have DIY courses for those of you who like to work at your own pace. And then we have our big program, which is one-on-one -on -one coaching and building and um, just taking it step by step. We have a big six-month program, but we are willing to talk to you about just taking pieces of that program if you already have parts of your platform built. So uh, www.authortrafficschool.com. Go check it out. So today's guest is Kelly Bartel, and Kelly spent 15 years living that advertising life you see on TV. And all I can imagine here, I hate to say this, Kelly, is Melrose Place back in the 90s when Heather Locklear is clearing off her desk to have sex with, who knows? I mean, they had sex at the office all the time. Um, and, I, and I thought that reflected the advertising world. So I'm going to have to query Kelly more about that. Um, Kelly ran a creative team for a global agency. She pitched a lot of business and she stayed up late. And, and I get that. That is a 24-7 job. Um, I'm surprised she stayed there 15 years. She played some foosball and she loved it. And in the process, she learned so much about what makes people and businesses tick. When Kelly went out on her own in 2020, she did it because there was one thing her glossy agency job wouldn't give her or couldn't give her. And that was the rush of working with startups and individuals growing their dreams. So what she did, that's what she does now. She builds brands for women, entrepreneurs, and creatives, and it's everything she dreamed it would be. And I, I'm sure it is. I'm sure she gets to work her own hours versus agency hours now. So stay tuned for my interview with Kelly. Kelly, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So I loved in your intro that the 15 years of living that advertising life you see on TV, and I actually, you know, shared the Melrose Place, like sex on the desk. I want you guys to know, and I'll have Kelly tell a story here. She's got to think of a story, but um, advertising really is a high burnout job, um, a career, because there is so much that goes on that um, it, it really is sort of like it is on TV. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any, just uh, before we go there, I just want you, if you've ever watched Bewitched, from the standpoint, I was an account services person. Um, what Darren Stevens goes through that the client is always right, <laughs> is really right on. And the things you have to do to make the client right are sometimes not really within your best interest. I don't know if I said that delicately. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, that's all the politics of agency life, right? That's why they don't let us creative people talk to the client because the client <laughs> is always right. And it makes us really cranky and we're not good at being nice about that always. Yeah. So, yeah. So like when, I was, when I was, back room. yeah, actually, um, when I was at Shia Day, someone gave me a voodoo doll and, uh, I used to just literally on the phone like oh yes of course we could do that like just beating that poor little doll to death <laughs> so tell um, us a good story from your days <laughs> well there was I was really trying to think of you know what's a really good illustration of the life that we no longer lead and when we talk about the agency life that you see on tv you know um this won't be a political story but I want to bring up Trump and that show that he had, The Pitch. It was maybe like five or 10 years ago. Oh. And if you remember the show, they would actually like film the pitch of an idea or a TV spot or a new product or what have you. And just, it looked like a joke, but that's really what it was like to like walk into a boardroom with just stone faced people and be at your most creative and pitch ideas and just have people literally kind of like tear boards in half and throw them on the ground. You know, that was, that was really quintessential of the time. And I remember we did a lot of business pitches of this type and I used to love pitching. I still do. Actually. I love getting up there and talking about the power of an idea and all of that. But we literally went into a pitch. They had me pose as an account person because I was the right age. I was, was probably 28 or 30. So I, I didn't know a lot anyway. And what I did know was about the creative art and the creative idea, but they wanted a young person to talk about the strategy. And they said, you're, you're it, you're going to get up there and do it. And just the, I can just still feel the sweat running down my back as I like stood in front of this crowd of probably 20 businessmen in suits and I pitched some sort of loyalty program and the strategy behind it and the math. Just meanwhile, like, I have no clue what I'm talking about. Don't ask me any questions. <laughs> and then as we left, we sort of filed out like school children. And then the next agency was like waiting in the hallway. Oh, wait, yeah. We file in. Just there's that and you'd like be at the hotel the night before the pitch like practicing in the rental conference room and the conference room next to you would be the competitive agency pitching their stuff and you would just like try not to make eye contact it was bonkers yeah yeah I actually wore uh readers the first couple times I did I I met and pitched with the clients and um it was interesting because I I really I, I finally got to the point where I could take them off but I did it because if you've ever like you can see close up, but you can't see far away. So I couldn't see the look on their face because I didn't want to <laughs> I didn't want to see like the disappointment or you know what was going on. I just wanted to give it and get out. <laughs> oh, that's such a good idea. That's a really <laughs> good idea. I'm just feeling nervous about it. Yeah. So we're gonna talk about branding today. And you guys, that's what Kelly really, really does well is the pitching, messaging, um, you know, everything to do with getting your brand right. So let's talk, let's first of all go to that sort of the conundrum that you face with personal versus business versus book. How do you get that all in alignment? It is a really tricky story problem. And I want to just honor that really quickly at the beginning, because as experienced business people and people who live in the world of entrepreneurship, if you're launching a business, it it's not one dimensional, but it's just one brand. You know, if you are launching the next Nike or whatever it might be, it's, it's an entity that sells things. And that is one focused message. But when you are a person with a business selling a product, in this case, a book, that's three layers of branding that you have to consider. And they do, to your point, have to line up. So the simplest one to, to think about in the context of this podcast is the book itself. So what's the brand of the book? What is the book 
what does it feel like? What does what is the main message that you're conveying through your book? And then how does your business relate to the message of the book and understanding if you are writing a book, say I'm writing a book about branding, which I'm not, but maybe I should. Um, I'm writing a book and it's about, about branding and I want it to feel really lighthearted yet informative. And I'm going to pick a color scheme that goes with that and some imagery on the front that reinforces this idea. But then I want to think about the work that I do outside of this imaginary authorship. And that is the work that I do as a branding expert. So I have to understand that I have a branding book written by an artist and branding expert. I am not my book, but I'm connected to it Mm -hmm. in a way that's very tangible. I also am lighthearted. And what did I say? Informational. I'm also informational. And then, so that's the, the service that I provide. And then that brings us to the personality of, of you, the author and business owner. And you want to think about someone like Michelle Obama or Oprah, these powerful humans who have a brand all their own. So knowing who you are and what position you have in the world you got to be able to talk about that so it's does that make sense it's like these three layers of the person that I am and the place that I hold in the world the service I provide to my community and then the artifact that I can sell that supports all of that so they they really are they really are connected but but separate yeah they are but the first thing and and we talked about this a little bit before we got on is um you know as a new entrepreneur you're kind of looking around at your competition and seeing what's working but you have to stay with your in your own authenticity who is that audience and how am i going to speak to them we we use uh we have all of the people in traffic school read why they buy so that they can not now have a language for their buyer but they also have to show up in a really um in an, an authentic way in their business because that's why people hire you but also in your book because your book is leading to bigger things so you do have to keep it all in the same space which you and I also talked about when you work with new entrepreneurs you know they get bored with their brand they want to rebrand right away but it's not really something they should be doing can you speak to that i can so The first thing that you mentioned about looking around and seeing what other people are doing, that can be really helpful, but it's a trap. To your point, you wind up being inauthentic if you try to copy what you like from from other people or even emulate it or, or take inspiration from it. What I find is really helpful when looking at competitive messaging and branding is that really can tell you what not to do from a branding standpoint. Like, um, I think... We may touch on color in a little bit, but like if you walk into your section of the bookstore that you can imagine yourself living in someday and 50% of the covers are red, don't pick red, no matter what it's called, (laughs) because you're just going to blend in. It's the same with, with branding messaging. You know, if you like something that someone else is doing great, feel free to like it, but do something different. So you stand out, Um, which brings me to the point of consistency which so pick what you're going to do sort of zig when others zag but also staying really consistent with that message is so so important one of the truths of communication is you have to communicate something a message a brand message seven times before people really hear it, where it really sinks in. So if you're changing regularly, if you're taught changing your tagline, changing the way you talk about your book, changing the way you talk about your expertise or your business, if you change it too much, it really confuses people and you wind up losing your audience. So I could tell you that, Every time I do an introduction, I call myself an executive creative director and storyteller. And 
maybe I don't want to do that anymore. Like maybe I want to talk about something a little bit different, (laughs) but I don't because it's the consistency is really, really important. And there's always going to be someone who hasn't met me before and needs that basic starting point. Mm -hmm. So when you start to get itchy in your messaging, because you've said it a lot, just remember your audience hasn't heard it a lot. So yes. just keep saying it. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't you tell me a minimum of seven times? That doesn't mean that you put it out there seven, like every day for seven days, and then your message changes though. <laughs> no, I mean average shelf life of something like a brand position or a brand is 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 three to five years. And it I absolutely encourage my entrepreneurial startup clients to think about reinvention as their business evolves, but the slow and steady really does win the race here. Branding is, it's hard work because you have to be really thoughtful and distill that message down. So once you've done that, you've done that work, you know, stick with it for a while and, and, and get the, get the feel of it. Don't try to do that hard work over and over again. You've already yeah. done it. Yeah. And I shared with you, like, we, I think we did our last one in like 2016. We're, we're due. Um, but I don't know that I'm quite ready. I, I like what I have still, but there will come a time when I will wake up and say, okay, enough. But the average is what, three to five years, people. So yeah, when, when people work with you and they, they do that startup, um, the message is wait until the brand matures to do some morphing of that. And it, 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 and it can't be like a 180 degree turnaround either. Cause that's where we get a lot of people who'll, who'll tell us, Oh, I have a list of 3000 people, but I kind of switch. So, you know, maybe two thirds of them aren't with us anymore. And that's the result of something like that, that they made a dramatic, Oh yeah, I was a time and management person and now I'm a healer. You know, those two things don't match together. So you can't make that big pivot in the middle of of something, even though you get tired of it, because I know I get tired of my own brand as well sometimes. So let's talk a little bit about the feel. Okay. Because at how the brand, like when you come, if I were to work with you and come in, I would imagine you would want to ask me some questions about my brand. So what kind of questions would you ask me? So to get a good sense of your business, there is only a few questions, but they're, they're hard. So it's hard work because what we start with is your position. And while that feels easy, it takes a little bit to unpack it. So I would ask you questions like, what do you do? And that's actually a really hard question for people to answer because people do a lot of different kinds of things all the time in their job. So what I do as part of of my job as a brand strategist is when people tell me, you know, I, I do this kind of strategy and these kinds of actions and I provide these kinds of services and I do it in, in this way, I look for the through line. So what, what brings all those things together? And that's the what you do. And then I'll ask, how you do it, what's your process, what lights you up about that, what brought you to this place, and where did you come from? Who is the competition? Who do you serve? So getting a landscape of both what you do, why you do it, who else is doing it, and how you're different. Because of that last piece, the how you're different, that is what's going to lead you to an ownable position in the market. And once you know what that thing is, this is the thing that makes me different as a producer of product. That's what you can stand on. So we start there Mm -hmm. and then we move from that to away from strategy and more, more toward tone and feel. So I always ask my clients to make for me what we call a mood board which is a combo platter of brands you might admire out in the world and want to emulate. Like we talked about before, where that temptation is to be, I want to be like that brand. I want to look like that brand, or I like the logo that that brand has, or I like the feeling that I get when I experience this brand. 
um, things like that, plus colors that are inspirational and feel like a good starting point imagery, just pull. I ask people to just pull, pull those things that speak to you. And then let's talk about them because that's what makes the mood board. And that then is a tool that your branding professional, if, if you're using one, will use to figure out what your unique look is. And that can be anything from font choices to photography versus something hand drawn. Do you want to use illustration? Is there an art piece that needs to be created? These all become questions that you as the brand don't need to answer, but we will want to have an opinion on at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So um, I'm just going to back up a little bit here. So you're actually taking my personality, my authenticity of all the stuff I brought you that I really like to ferret out and make that in alignment with what my brand should look like to keep my business and me in alignment, it sounds like. Yes. 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 I'm so pointed that out because that, that's what's so cool about working with entrepreneurs like authors because you get to do that you get to take what's magical about the person creating the work and infuse it into the brand so there's this alchemy between the person creating the brand and the target audience because there is a connection between you the author and them your audience and the the brand's job is to kind of speak to and of both of those things at the same time yeah, exactly. So um, this is why you guys, I think I've spoken before, um, when you hire someone to do to do your funnels, to put together whatever it is on your platform, this is why the market research is so important. Because if you don't do the market research and you go to Kelly and you just say, make me, <laughs> uh, Kelly has no idea where to start. So that's why when we we always tell people like the build your author uh, the build your author um, avatar course like you have to do that market research. You and I coming from agencies, how much do agencies spend on market research? Because oh, even before we go into this pitch, we have to have them down to make everything relatable. So you have to do you have to be able to tell Kelly who's your competition. You have to know that I send people out to do that anyway, because I want to know what is your competition selling? What does it look like they're doing successful? What does it look like they're doing that's not? Kelly needs to know those same things in order to get you really well branded. And um, you'll probably agree with this. If you don't have that down and then you take your business to a marketing agency, it's going to be a flop because they're, they're not going to do that research for you. No, they're going to trust that you have done it. Mm -hmm. And if you if you don't do it well, yeah, it'll it'll just flop because if you are selling bread to people who don't eat gluten, <laughs> you're not going to sell any bread. That, that, that is an analogy. That is very true. And most of the time when I see an intake for an online marketing company, it will ask questions, who is your ideal client? And they'll just take it straight off there. They're not going to get into a deeper query. They're going to assume you already did this work with someone like Kelly and got it done. <laughs> so true. And one of the, it's a, it's like a psychological story problem almost when we're thinking about, and I know this call isn't about research, but it's, it is so prevalent and important in everything we do. We're not just like kidding around when we talk about it. The the narrower your target is actually the more helpful it is mm -hmm. yes for someone like me especially but for the success of your product because if you can tell me you know let's just take this bread thing all the way to the finish line you know i'm making i'm writing i'm <laughs> authoring a book about bread and i've got bread recipes and all this content about all of the things you know you could say your, your target's not people who eat, that's too broad and includes the gluten intolerant people. It's not even people who eat bread. 
it's people who love bread and it's not people just people who love bread it's people who love artisan bread that is made with care and thought and if you can come to a branding person and say hey i want to sell this book to bread loving people who are artistic and artisan thinkers that tells me a lot about what I need to do with the design of the brand and the messaging of the brand to speak to those people. It's um, way, way, way more effective to have a focused message toward a focused audience because it'll make more sense to absolutely everybody. Yeah. All of yeah. the brand. It definitely, definitely does. And we actually find once we give our people the build your author avatar course and have them read why, why, they, why they buy, um, they will come back and say, I need to rewrite parts of my book because I didn't, I wasn't really focused, you know, very narrowly on who I wrote this book for. So, you know, that's, that you guys is why you need to work with someone like Kelly and have that stuff done and know even even before you start writing that book, know exactly who you're speaking to <laughs> as part of this process. Let's talk a little bit about color um, before before we sign off here. Um, I get people all the time. I will look at their their website. You know, we're trying to coordinate everything with the book or they'll tell me what they want on their book cover. And I'll say, well, wait a minute. You just told me that your your audience is nurture, yet you have all of these colors that don't support nurture. And the uh, the example I always like to give, and uh, bless her heart, she's a wonderful individual. I hate picking her on her all the time. Is the red hot healer? Red doesn't fit healing. So, can you talk a little bit about that? There is a psychology of color in all of this. There is, there's a psychology of color as part of my bachelor of fine arts. I went to art school and got a design degree and all the rest of it. There are classes and classes you can take on color theory. And it is so helpful if you're new to color theory and you're just sort of starting to think about what colors do I want to choose for my brand or for my book or for my website or for my whatever, is you can actually do a quick Google search and it'll tell you a lot. Um, mm -hmm. What co what colors are cheerful? And I'll give you the internet's opinion on that and it'll really actually start to narrow it down fairly quickly. I know you also have a color guide within your curriculum, which is also really helpful, but the psychology of color is both very specific and also reliant on its circumstance. So what I mean by that is you can know that purple is a color of luxury and because it's the color of royalty, that's where it lives in our brain, but not all purples are created equal. So when you think about a, a, a brand or a book and you think I really love the color purple I'm going to use the color purple for my for my book but your vibe is not rich or royal you want to be really accessible and easy breezy you might be able to get away with like a light purple because mm -hmm. it's just a hint of what you're getting with like a deep true purple in something like the red hot healer red is it's really next to yellow the color of caution so red tells us yeah. heat it tells us passion it can also tell us danger uh, which none of those things really align with healing but what i find interesting about that example is that you have that tension then so if you're calling yourself the red hot healer, are you, what kind of heat are you bringing to the table? Do you want for some reason, I haven't read the book, but <laughs> you want for some reason to lean into that sort of danger. Red is, if we're curious about the psychology of color, red is the color of blood. And that's why it takes us to this sort of violent, dangerous place. 
but you could potentially lean into that and the sh- then the shock value of that. And if we're talking about red hot healing and, you know, that, that could go somewhere interesting, but just on the surface of things, it doesn't take me to that place. Yellow, it's cheerful, but also, like I said, caution. Mm-hmm. The, for our brains in particular, I could talk about this forever. This is the last one, I promise. But yellow and black, together is actually the highest contrast color combination you can achieve it's Mm -hmm. not black and white it's black and yellow because of the ways our brains are wired so if you want to have a very disruptive very interruptive design use black and yellow by all means but know also that it's going to be jarring and and people will be cautious of it because we are trained to be cautious of things that are black and yellow. Think about those signs on the side of the highway where if you were to go the wrong way up the on-ramp or or whatever it is, the signs that say, don't go this way, they're black and yellow. Exactly. And the thing with the red hot healer is she is a beautiful redhead. Mm -hmm. But would you know that if you didn't see her picture, and you just saw some marketing. I think that's where the disconnect uh, kind of went there. So Kelly, you are developing a course for us for Author Traffic School on branding. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing there? And you guys, you'll be able to go over, and um, probably by the time this airs, we will have it up on the site for you to purchase as well. Yes, I would love to talk about it. I am preparing the content now. It's called Building a Brand. It's an online online course for authors specifically, because as we talk about targeting, my target for this course is people who are authors and, and writing books, but it's a four part course and it really covers these kind of basic things that we've been talking about. I'm going to go into what is a brand in the first place? What What is it and why is it important to think about branding when we think about authorship? We're going to talk about identifying your brand position and how to do that. I know that there's a lot of nuance to that in your in your course, but your position as an author and your position of your book in the marketplace and understanding that as it pertains to your brand, that'll be a whole section. We're going to talk then about crafting your brand style. And that's where we get into color theory, like we were just talking about. How do you deal with fonts? What kind of style do you both like because you want to love your book every time you pick it up you want to love your brand and your website but what is actually functioning well in terms of your audience and how do you walk that line and then we'll talk about bringing it together and what that looks like so when you bring all of those components together that's when you wind up with things like websites logos book covers that's how you wind up with a set of assets that to your point from the very beginning of our conversation, they line up and they work together as a family. Did I miss anything? No, I think this is great. So you'll be able to find that. Hopefully this is airing on March 7th. We'll have it up on Author Traffic School by then. But if people just want to skip the course and go right to Give Me Some Kelly, where do we find you? (laughs) You find me actually at my brand new site, which is kellybartell.com. And I I also have had my own brand for between three and five years and I had to redo my own. So check it out anyway. I'm very proud of it. So I live there and I also live on LinkedIn at Kelly Bartell and on Instagram at Kelly Bartell underscore work edition. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being on today. And I hope you guys learned a lot because this is truly your first step when you start putting everything together for your new business or your book or, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're launching. So thank you. Thank you.